All right, we're now live for session 10 of Understanding Anger 2.0. So this is a class that I've been doing off and on. I intended for it to be monthly, but didn't always get to it every single month. Uh, and we'll talk about the structure of the class in a bit. Um, it came out of a face-to-face -face class that I was teaching at Marquette University for undergraduates having to do with anger, a semester-long class, but also out of an earlier set of uh, in-person presentations that I did back in 2015, it would be, at the Kingston Public Library and invited monthly lecture series where we looked at literature and philosophy and religious texts dealing with the emotion of anger. And people were, you know, interested in that and said, why don't you restart it? So that's what this is. This may go on for quite a long time because there's a lot of texts, thinkers, movements, approaches that have to do with anger that I think could be quite interesting for us as people who are going to study the phenomenon and who have to deal with, with anger. So today we're going to be starting uh, a new chapter, let's say. We've looked at quite a bit of ancient Greek literature, some epic, some other poetry like Hesiod, um, some, some Greek tragedies as well. But we're going to come back to that sort of stuff again. We've also spent two sessions each on Plato and Aristotle, two early important philosophical theories. So now we're going to be looking at another philosophical school that was very important in ancient times and has had some you know, attraction for people in uh, the Renaissance, early modern times, all the way down to the present. And that is the Epicurean school founded by Epicurus. And it's uh, quite different than Plato and Aristotle in a number of important respects that we'll, we'll talk about in just a bit. So I'm envisioning spending two sessions on the Epicureans. This one, we're going to be focused mostly on what we've got from Epicurus himself and then from this uh, Latin poet who was an Epicurean, uh, Lucretius, who wrote a philosophical poem, which is kind of a digest of Epicurean teachings and arguments called On the uh, Nature of Things. There is a really important Epicurean thinker who I'm going to put off most of the discussion till the next time that we look at the Epicureans down the line, and that's a guy called Philodemus. And we're not doing him next time, in part because I'm actually hoping that we, we get our hands on some additional sources. So um, there, you know, why, why that? Well, we should explain it. You may have seen the news recently, uh, articles that have been in all sorts of sources about them managing to use AI to decipher some of the scrolls that were found in the library of Herculaneum. So that appears to have been uh, a largely Epicurean library. And that is where we get a lot of Philodemus, who we know existed from, from other authors who talk about him. That's where we've gotten his recently acquired texts. Um, he has a work called On Anger, which we'll look at in a, in a later session. But unfortunately, it's kind of fragmentary because when they were able to get the text open, they, they messed it up a good bit. Um, he's also got some other works that are kind of relevant, like On Frank Speech, uh, which is Peri Paracies. Um, and we're going to put off talking about him till, till a later session. I think because we've got enough to talk about with Epicurus and other people's takes on him and Lucretius. So the Epicureans are going to be um, providing us with a viewpoint that's alternative to the ones that we've seen so far in two really important ways. And one way has to do with um, we could call it cosmology and theology. The Epicureans do believe that there are gods, and you can talk meaningfully about them, but the gods don't feel anger. So what does that mean for us human beings? 
you don't need to spend your life, what you have of it, worried about a bad afterlife or that the gods are going to be angry with you for whatever reason and do bad things to you, right? That is not something that needs to be on your radar. And as a matter of fact, for the Epicureans, it's not just um, that it's, it's something you don't need to think about. If you are thinking about it, you are going to screw up your life and you're doing bad things, not just to yourself, but to other people by passing on these mistaken ideas. So that's that's where uh, you could say that that uh, Epicurus and Lucretius are going to differ from the poets that we, we've seen so far, like Homer and Hesiod and the Greek tragedians, Aeschylus, um, uh, Euripides, who has Athena being mad at, at people. Oh, no. Sophocles, sorry, and then Euripides, where Medea is, is, is you know, sort of uh, very angry. There, there isn't that much of divine anger in that uh, particular thing, although it's invoked on her. Now, Epicurus is also differing from Plato and Aristotle in a massively important way. He is what we call a hedonist. So whereas Aristotle and Plato didn't say that pleasure is a bad thing, leads us astray, and there are better things, greater goods than pleasure, for the Epicureans, human happiness consists in a life that has as much pleasure and as little pain as possible. And pleasure and pain are the things that we're supposed to be using, consulting, thinking about in order to uh, govern our lives, in order to be in touch with things. And wisdom, practical wisdom, prudence, phronesis, consists in understanding these, these sorts of matters. Now, we're not going to have as systematic a perspective on anger as we had with Aristotle, with the Epicureans, and we will have later with the Stoics, who we're going to look at in a few months. But we do have some discussions about anger, and this is part of a larger systematic philosophical perspective much of which, unfortunately, is, is lost. So here's what we're going to do in today's session. Um, I'm going to talk about the sources that we actually have because this presents a certain kind of problem. We're going to do a little history lesson about how this school became important. We'll talk about the broader teachings that the Epicureans have, like their key ideas and practices and doctrines. Then we'll zoom in on Epicurus, Epicurus's and, and Epicurean teachings about anger. And then we'll see what L Lucretius adds to the picture. And we'll, we'll take pauses for Q&A and comments and discussion at various points. And you can leave whatever you want in the chat. You know, if I'm uh, uh, in the middle of explaining something, I may not respond to it immediately, but you, you know, it's, it's there, I see it. So we can uh, certainly grapple with any of these sorts of things. It is not an AMA where you just ask questions about anything whatsoever. This is about anger and Epicurean philosophy, but you can ask anything that you like that's that's connected to that. So let's talk about sources, right? <clears throat> what do we actually have? Epicurus, according to ancient sources, was one of the most prolific authors in all of antiquity. Unfortunately, what we have of him is actually just a tiny, tiny little selection, even 1% of what he wrote. So what we do have is something that's called the principal doctrines, or sometimes in older texts, you'll see it called the sovereign maxims. That's 40-odd uh, short passages drawn from his work, sort of like Epictetus's Enchiridion, right? It's like a little tiny handbook. We have a similar thing in the Vatican sayings, which are 81 short passages, which were discovered in a 14th century manuscript in the Vatican library. And there's some uh, overlap between the two of those. There's some passages that are the same. So we've got two doxographies, right? Two presentations of Epicurus's idea. We have three letters, um, two of which are about natural philosophy. There's a, there's technically four letters, but one of them is only like two lines, so we don't worry about that. The letter to uh, Menosius is the one that's about ethics, and so that's the one that's more relevant to us. 
And then we have, you know, a bunch of fragments here and there in other texts by other authors who I'll talk about in just a bit, usually hostile to Epicureanism. And then we have a will. He actually left a uh, last will and testament behind about how his resources ought to be shared, how his school ought to be continued. Um, doesn't turn out anything to do with anger particularly, but it's interesting that he had a will. Now, um, lost texts. We might actually find these. Uh, there's prospects that perhaps these Herculaneum scrolls might have some of these lost texts that we uh, simply haven't had access to for you know, two millennia. So he wrote a 37 book, that's 37 scrolls, book on nature. And perhaps that contains some discussions of the human emotions and how they work. So, you know, that would be great. He's also, he had a book on love, which might have something to do with anger, on choice and avoidance, which is about, you know, practical reasoning and prioritization, uh, a book on life probably has some references to anger on just dealing, um, you know, actually on just behavior, right behavior, which probably has some stuff about anger, but we don't know because we don't have the text. And then finally, he wrote a book on the emotions, also called Against Timocrates, that would definitely have a discussion of anger. And perhaps that's some of the stuff that we see being referred to by other authors who probably had access to those documents, but we don't have them. So we only have book titles, which are nice and promising. Uh, we do have Lucretius, as I mentioned, this great uh, poem, the, the Nature of Things, and he provides us with many of Epicurus's teachings reinterpreted in his own time. And for all we know, he may be drawing on Epicurus's book on, on nature. Then we have, of course, Philodemus of Gadara, who we're going to talk about more in a subsequent session. Um, you know, the, the library at Herculaneum, where all of these scrolls were, were burned, but have been, you know, safely recovered and are now being scanned. Um, that's, you know, promising. Maybe we'll get a lot more of his stuff. There's also this very interesting inscription of Epicurean texts on a wall uh, dating back to the first century AD that was commissioned by Diogenes of Oinanda. And it, I'll mention a passage from that a little bit later on. But it's interesting. When we want to read Plato, we read Plato, right? When we want to read Aristotle, we read Aristotle. If we want to know about the Epicureans and what Epicurus himself taught, sometimes we have to go to the critics of the Epicureans. And basically everybody in ancient times who wasn't an Epicurean was a critic of the Epicureans. They didn't have any fellow travelers or allies or anything like that. So who would we go to? So for Epicurean teachings more broadly, we have Cicero, who has a book called On the Ends. Book one is an Epicurean, Torquatus, presenting the Epicurean doctrine. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that. Um, Cicero is, is having him, is sort of setting him up to knock him down afterwards. Uh, book one of On the Nature of the Gods, you have another Epicurean present the Epicurean position on the gods. Then there's a book called The Academics, where Cicero is, is Epicurean's thought in terms of epistemology or the theory of knowledge and why they're, why they're wrong about stuff. Um, there's also a guy who's not a philosopher so much, Athenaeus, who wrote a book called the, um, it's often called the Sophists at Dinner, the Philosophers at Dinner, the Deipnosophistae, the Wise People at, at Dinner. And he portrays the Epicureans as being harsh or, you know, very frank in conveying truth. And it doesn't say much more about that. Uh, we do get Plutarch, who talks a good bit about the Epicureans, also not a fan of them. And the main work we'd want to look at with that is that it's not possible to live pleasant, pleasurably according to the doctrine of Epicurus, where he's explicitly criticizing them. Why would we want to look at that? Because he'll say, here's what the Epicureans think. Here's why they're wrong, right? So 
that can be quite, quite helpful. And then we actually have a very early Christian author, Lactantius, who writes a book called The Anger of God. And he tells us about what the Epicureans thought, again, in order to say how they've gotten things wrong. So those are the sources that we're going to be relying upon. Let's talk a little bit about their history, and then maybe we'll stop for a little Q&A and then jump into Epicurean doctrines. So Epicurus is one of the few philosophers of his time who is outside of the, you could say, the, the influence or lineage of Socrates. Um, he is coming from the outside, arrives at Athens after having taught in Mytilene and then Lampsacus, um, where he's actually, he's leaving because he's being, uh, he and his friends are being um, kind of, you know, persecuted. And he founds a, a place called the Garden. And that's what the Epicurean um, school is actually often called, the, the Garden. Uh, between the Stoa, where the Stoics are, Stoa Poikile, and the Academy, um, well, the Stoa later on, and he, he creates a kind of society of friends in the garden, you know, sort of a, well, you could call it a commune if you want, right? He's got enough money, they, they can eat, they can drink, they hang out to, together, he teaches, writes, has uh, friendly relations with people, not interested in sex, not super interested in gourmet dining or anything like that. Very interested in natural phenomena and talking with, with people. And, um, you know, he's going to live there for quite a while. He's got a, a good friend, uh, Metrodorus, who's an early popularizer of Epicurean philosophy. And he would have been the natural successor to Epicurus, but unfortunately he dies about seven years before Epicurus leaving a son named Epicurus and a daughter in the garden. And Epicurus provides for them in his will. After that, we get, as we usually do with ancient philosophy, what are called scholarchs, you know, leaders of the school in the Athenian garden. And the Epicureans spread out through um, the, you could say, the, the Macedonians' uh, um, successor states and into the Roman Empire as well. So you can find them all over the place. You can find them any, any place that philosophy is big. You, you can, after a while, find Epicureans. It becomes quite influential in Roman circles. So we've got this guy Torquatus as a prime representative. Some people wanted to say that, that Julius Caesar was, in fact, an Epicurean. Probably doubtful. He doesn't appear to have been super, super interested in philosophy. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of like being a pleasure seeker that for a lot of people was um, viewed as being Epicurean and it influences certain poets, for example, Horace. And as I, I mentioned, there's a lot of people who are critical of the Epicureans. Um, and so, you know, they've got uh, quite a few other schools, all of whom agree that Epicureans are, they're not as bad as the other hedonists, but they're not good because they make pleasure the measure of what is good. So the Stoics, the Aristotelians, the Platonists, the Cynics, the Skeptics, they all have beefs with the Epicureans. And we'll actually see that, um, you know, there's, there's also medical people who are interested in Epicureanism because they have a physical uh, account. Again, if we had Epicurus's book on nature, we'd know more about that, but we don't. And Epicureanism kind of takes a nosedive in late end, but we see revivals of it in the Renaissance and in the early modern period. So just to give you a few examples, you may have heard of Pierre Gassendi, uh, and you think about him in terms of like gases and physical things like that. He was actually a Catholic priest and a philosopher and a correspondent of René Descartes, and he was an Epicurean. Um, Ninon de Lenclos, who is a little bit later, is a French woman who writes a very interesting book about love, and it's from an Epicurean perspective. Um, there's many others as well. There's people who are influenced by the Epicureans to some degree. And, um, you know, very often this was tied with a very worldly way of looking at things, a hedonistic way of looking at things. And you can say that Epicureanism 
feeds into what we think of as the Enlightenment. And there are Epicureans around today. It is probably, I would say, the second largest group of people interested in classical philosophy and applying it as a way of life in the present, um, including somebody who's not far from where I currently am in Milwaukee, uh, here in Crespo down in Chicago, right? So it's, it's, it's a philosophy with some legs, you could say. So I've, I've already thrown a lot of stuff at you. Any, any questions, uh, comments, clarifications needed at this point? Um, We'll uh, jump shortly into talking about the doctrines of the Epicureans in general, and then we'll talk about what we have to say about, about Aang, but maybe there's a few things people want to bring up. It doesn't look like there's any, so maybe we'll, we'll put that off until a little bit later. So what do the Epicureans believe? Um, they're materialists meaning that they think that everything is matter. And they're also atomists. They think that everything is little bits of matter that you can't divide any further. Um, they've got this idea that they're taking from Democritus um, about atoms falling in the void. But then uh, Epicurus also introduces this idea of like randomness, or they call it the swerve. Every once in a while, one of these things zigs instead of zags. And that's where we get freedom from. They also, as I mentioned earlier, they believe that there are gods, but they're a very different kind of god than what you find in mythology. These are gods who are supremely happy and, you know, in a certain sense, provide us with a great example because they don't care about anything that happens in the world. As a matter of fact, they're not even in the world. They're in, you know, they talk about the interstices, these, these places between different worlds. The Epicureans, by the way, believed in a universe with many, many worlds. And these, these gods, they don't get themselves mixed up with the affairs of us messy, stupid human beings. That's why they're happy, because they stay out of things that would aggravate them. Um, Epicurus and, and his followers devoted a lot of attention to natural philosophy or physics. And the reasons that they did this were really twofold. One was they thought that that was enjoyable. You know, if you're a person who likes learning, makes sense, right? They also thought it's really important to understand the way the universe works so you don't believe all this silly stuff that other people are telling you about the gods. If you don't think the gods are going to get angry at you, you don't have to fear the gods, right? Um, so that, that's an important part. They also, another thing that they thought was a, a, a sort of baseless or groundless or empty, we say, fear was the fear of death. And the Epicureans have a lot of interesting discussions about why we don't have to worry about being dead. Probably the easiest one is the one that Epicurus himself says, namely that, um, you know, when you're dead, there's no you to be worried about anything. Um, once you're, once you're uh, gone, there's no you. There's, it, it's, it's not even a question. So until you're actually dead, you don't really need to worry about dying. And you said, well, why'd you write a will then? Well, obviously, Epicurus knows that other people are going to be around afterwards. Um, now, Kids Study Hour says they don't consider themselves like everyone else. I'm not sure what that means, so you're probably going to have to explain that. Like everybody else, in, in what way? Um, they also think that because they're materialists, that sensation is a reliable guide to truth, um, along with what they call preconceptions, which are sort of general notions that we have, that we apply to things. This is also something that the Stoics will, will talk about. And then we get to hedonism. So we, we, that's their physical stuff. Ethically, they think that pleasure is the fundamental good. Pain or trouble is the fundamental bad. So you want to set your life up and make your decisions and establish your priorities in such a way as to give yourself the most pleasant life possible. Now, does that mean you should party all the time and you know get drunk and try to have as much sex as possible? No, it's not that kind of hedonism. 
Uh, it's not sex, drugs, and, and rock and roll constantly. And it's kind of interesting. If you look at old rock and rollers, they can't quite keep that up all the time, can they? Um, and so what is the ultimate goal? Being untroubled, ataraxia, not being uh, disturbed or shaken by things. A pleasant life that is free of, of pain as much as possible. And so they're going to make a couple important distinctions. You know, if you want to understand pleasures, you have to study them. If you want to understand pains, you have to study them as well. So one of the biggest things that is often difficult for people to wrap their head around, the greatest pleasures, according to the Epicureans, are not what they call moving or kinetic pleasures. So think about when you actually eat something, right? You uh, enjoy what you're eating and you're, you're, you know, taking some pleasure in it um, or, you know, having sex or things like that. They involve some sort of action or, or change. They are positive in a sense. Then they have what are called static or catastemic pleasures. And these arise when pain or trouble is removed. So, you know, you can enjoy taking a drink because you're thirsty and now the pain of thirst is removed. And that sort of evenness, um, that is a greater pleasure than the initial taste that you're getting with the thing. So the rest, the relaxation that comes with things is a positive state for them. And so this is quite important if you're going to govern your life, right? They also talk about the difference between pleasures of the just the body itself and pleasures of the mind. And bodily pleasures are, you feel them while you have them. Same with bodily pains, right? But we're, we're creatures that have memory and can anticipate things coming ahead. And we can appreciate aspects of things that are not just at the level of, you know, animal bodies. We have, we have minds, right? Now the minds are material. So that's, that's important. Um, and so, you know, mental pleasures and mental pains can be much more intense, lasting than just physical pleasures. And this is where the Epicureans differed from many of the other hedonists. Uh, for example, the Cyrenaic school of Aristippus, who said physical pleasure, that's where it is, man. Don't worry about the mental stuff. Just concentrate on, on the fun stuff, in which case you got to keep yourself being stimulated all the time, right? Um, the other thing that they're going to talk about, which is really important, is a distinction between not just pleasures, but desires. What is it that we want? So we want things that we feel are going to give us pleasure, that are going to provide us with good feelings, right? And Epicurus will say you got three basic kinds. And you could think of it as a square that where one part of it is, is missing. So you've got what's natural and what's unnatural or not natural. And then you've got what's necessary and what's not necessary. So you've got, um, oh, it's good to see Hiram Crespo's here. This is quite amazing. <laughs> So happy to see him here and answering questions. Just mentioned him earlier in the conversation. Uh, we've never actually met up, although, you know, that's more uh, an issue for, for me since we're so close by. But in any case, let, so let me go on. So we got three, three sort of categories, right? We got the natural and necessary. And opposed to that would be the, un, the not natural, not necessary. And then we've got things that are natural, but they're not necessary. So, you know, we could think about um, sexuality as falling into the, the natural, but not necessary. I mean, there's some people who are like, oh, if I don't have sex, I'm going to die. No, you're not. Uh, Epicurus, actually, who, you know, thought it was just fine to not get it on with anybody. And there's all sorts of possibilities of, of having, you know, sex in ways or pursuing sex in ways that are, you know, kind of not, not really natural from the, the ancient point of view. Uh, you could think of all the fetishes that people have out there that are, are readily available for, you know, perusal on the internet. But another great example is food, right? You, you, you will die if you don't eat, right? So, you know, what you need to eat is, in order to stay alive, is not the huge, wide range of things. And, you know, the natural and necessary, that can be supplied very easily. 
And then we can have things that are natural, but they're not necessary. And then we can have all sorts of crazy ideas. And this is where like restaurants come in, right? Um, I need to have tacos and they better be made with this kind of ingredient and they must be served to me on silver plates or golden plates or pick whatever else you want. Or the decor of the restaurant must be, that's, that's neither natural nor necessary. And our ideas about, what, you know, our, the things that promote our desires for those sorts of things are going to be um, what what uh, the Epicureans call empty opinion or vain opinion, kenodoxia, right? Um, Wrong-headed ideas, you could say. Unfounded is another translation of this. So um, that's something really central. There's there's two other little bits and pieces that I want to bring up. Um, so there's this wonderful little saying that you see repeated at a number of points from Epicurus and in the literature, you can't live pleasantly, so you can't actually live a, the life that you want without living prudently, justly, and it could be translated as well or as beautifully, um, kalos in, in Greek. And prudence is needed, practical wisdom, because you've got to figure out what you should say yes to and what you should say no to right? That's very important. How do you prioritize? How do you choose between the pleasures that are calling out to you? And then justice turns out to be really important for the Epicureans as well. And now they don't think that there's any sort of absolute justice that holds every single place. It's based on a sort of usefulness. and uh, But it is based on natural norms that are going to be pretty constant across societies, people don't want to be harmed, right? So there's a, a kind of social agreement, there's mutual advantage or usefulness. And why is this important? You don't want to, to have an unpleasant life with other people doing things to you. And, and if you do the wrong thing, you might get punished. You might have a guilty conscience, you know? So those are important. And then the last thing that I'll say about Epicurean doctrine, then we'll jump into the conversation before we get to the anger part. Friendship is also centrally important for Epicurus. By the way, in our uh, online um, uh, Ancient Philosophers on Friendship, next week is devoted to the Epicureans on friendship uh, for my students who are enrolled in that class. And uh, the Epicureans uh, took a lot of heat from other ancient philosophers who were like, well, you hedonists, you can't really believe in friendship. It, you're, just, you're friends with people just for what you can get from them. You're not really friends. And the Epicureans produced some you know, arguments to say, no, no, friendship, you could start it out because it's, you know, you're getting pleasure from somebody or some sort of usefulness. But eventually, you know, as, as the, the song goes, I've become accustomed to your face, right? You get used to people and you value them for, your, for their own sake. And it also does provide with security and enjoyment. And this is a great place to go to the uh, question from Virtual Natura. Can pleasure also arise from witnessing the pleasure of another being? Yeah. Um, you can, you can, you know, this is what happens in friendship, right? You want your friend to actually enjoy themselves. It would be weird if you were like, ooh, I don't care about my friend. The pleasure is the good. I don't care about my friend having a good time, right? Or even just random strangers, um, seeing them being made happy in certain ways, probably good. And conversely, you could be pained at seeing the undeserved pain or the pain that's caused by imprudence of other people. And by the way, so this is a bit of a, a jump. If we move forward into the 18th century and onward where utilitarianism is a hedonistic doctrine, this is exactly what Bentham calls benevolence, where you feel pleasure at seeing the pleasure of another person or even thinking about the pleasure of another person. Likewise, pain at their pain. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the, the dis discussions about um, Francis Wright, um, but I'll just say there's, there's lots of, of Epicureans and people influenced by Epicureanism out there in the, the modern age. 
Um, any other questions about like general doctrines for the um, for the Epicureans? I almost said utilitarians. I will also say with English gal, we're not discussing Spivak. This is about Epicureans. This is about it, the emotion of anger and stuff like that. So it's not a general AMA. But any other questions about Epicurean doctrine before I move on to talking about anger? While I'm while we're teeing those up, I'll say there's really two main things, two main domains that we can talk about when it comes to anger. There's questions about the anger of the gods, and remember the Epicureans, the, the gods don't get angry, and then there's us poor mortal saps down here, and how anger works for us, and we know that we get angry. Right? So, all right, so um, kids study now kindness, friendship, and living civil with each other is some of the characteristics of Epicureans I gather based on your explanation. Yeah, and you know, the, the Epicureans in ancient times would organize these little communities. And, um, you know, it's not that they wouldn't be nice to other people, but it was felt like, you know, the garden is kind of a model. And there are uh, Epicurean groups all the way down to the present. Um, you know, there's an online sort of worldwide Epicurean community that, that Hiram is a, a significant part of and leader within. Uh, I should re recommend too, and I don't know, Hiram, do you want to put a link to your book, Tending the Epicurean Garden, into the chat? Because uh, I, I recommend that to, to people as a good source for contemporary Epicureanism, and there's a discussion of, of precisely what Kids Study Now is, is talking about in there. All right, well, let's, let's talk about anger. So the gods, right? Maxim 1 says the gods are fee free from feeling anger, urge, or what we could call favoritism. It's translated in different ways. Gratitude, charis is the, the Greek. And why? because these movements imply a certain kind of weakness, a dependency. So if you're an Epicurean, you think that the gods are independent of all of that sort of stuff. Um, in the, the wall inscription, we have this, this cool fragment uh, that says, let us contradict Homer who talks all sorts of nonsense about them, representing them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, with, with the wrong sorts of, of ways. Some statue of God shoot arrows and are produced holding a bow, represented like Hercules and Homer. Others are attended by a bodyguard of wild beasts. Others are angry with the prosperous. Oftentimes, the Greek gods were portrayed as being angry, and there's lots of words for that in Homer and Hesiod, or as being envious. Thonos um, is, is a, a bad state of emotion. And then they, you know, they do bad things. And so it, it concludes, so we can smile back at them rather than be afraid of them, right? Worrying about the gods being angry with you is a mistaken or empty opinion that's just been circulated around throughout society, according to the Epicureans. Um, so in Plutarch, in his, it's not possible to live pleasurably according to the doctrine of Epicurus. And Lactantius are both saying some interesting things. He says, God is good, and that he is, and he that is good can on no account fall into. Now, notice the different emotions envy, fear, anger, or hatred, for it's not proper to a hot thing to cool, but to heat, nor to a good thing to do harm. Now, anger is by nature at the farthest distance imaginable from as this is the translation, complacency, or haris, right? Orge is distance from haris. Spleenishness from placidness. So spleenishness is holos, um, another word for anger that we've encountered in, in many of the Greek writings, from uh, eumenias, a peaceful mind, and uh, animosity and turbulence from humanity and kindness. Philanthropou, okay, philanthropou. Uh, philanthroponos to dusmenes. Dusmenes, menace is wrath, right? And so dusmenes is like wrath that's even worse. Now, this is Plutarch setting out, at this point, a position that's compatible with the Epicurean position. 
And then he'll say, for the latter of these, proceed from generosity and fortitude, the former from impotency and baseness. So the, the God is not constrained by either anger or kindness. Now, here's where he's going to differ from the Epicureans. So the Epicurean gods, they don't get angry. They also don't exhibit gratitude, kindness, favoritism. Plutarch says ah, they're right about one, wrong about the other. Um, it's natural to God to be kind and aiding, unnatural to be angry and, and hurtful. Um, a little bit later on in, in time, Lactantius in, on the anger of God, which is a very important document for gleaning some, some ideas about the Epicureans, he says that uh, the Epicureans say that as there is no anger in God, there is no kindness. When Epicurus thought it was inconsistent with God to injure and inflict harm, which for the most part arises from the affectation of anger. He took from him beneficence also, since it's, he, he thought that it followed if God is anger, he must also have kindness. So he deprives God of all emotions or the gods of all emotions. And that's where Lactantius thinks, um, like Plutarch, the Epicureans have gone wrong. So what can we take from this? Um, Epicurus, they, they agree with him in saying that God isn't going to get angry. With Lactantius, God does get angry, but not the way human beings do. You know, it's not an anthropomorphized anger. Uh, with Plutarch, he's saying, yeah, the Epicureans are right. God doesn't get angry. Um, they just think that the Epicureans are wrong and that God doesn't have positive emotions towards human beings. So, you know, that's an interesting negative teaching. What about us, us poor slobs down here in this world? So there's a great uh, Vatican saying from that, that set of uh, do doctrines. If parents have cause to be angry with their children, of course it is foolish to resist and thus not try to beg for forgiveness. But if they do not have cause and are angry without reason, it is ridiculous to make an appeal to one who is irrationally opposed to hearing such an appeal and thus not try to convince him by other means in a spirit of goodwill. So you could apply this to not just parents and children, but anybody where there's a power relationship or perhaps even equals. It could be spouses, you know, romantic partners. If they're, if they're angry with us for good cause, and notice, for Epicureans, it is possible to be angry with good cause, right? They're not saying anger is always bad the way the Stoics will or the way that some Christian authors will. Um, they, they're not saying that most of our anger is good. Most of our anger actually is off base, um, you know, angry without good reason. People have their reasons but they're not usually good reasons. And so, you know, we're getting a really important distinction here. If we think about wanting to live well, pleasantly, free of pains and fears, um, we can now bring these Epicurean doctrines in and think about implications. So if we're going to live prudently, well, and justly, how compatible is this with feeling anger, acting on anger, having an angry disposition, being somebody who's, you know, ready to, to blow up at other people or making others angry. An Epicurean, now Epicurus doesn't say this in the text that we have, but we don't have that much, right? Would be saying, you know, think about whether it's actually prudent, whether it's, it's beautiful or fine to let yourself get all angry about trivial things that don't matter so much or whether it's just. Um, in terms of living well, kalos, which could be honorably or beautifully, you know, anger very often doesn't appear all that attractive. And it, I would guess that the ancient Epicureans thought that you probably want to try to avoid this. Anger also can get in the way of prudence. It has a tendency that we saw with Aristotle and Plato to lead our practical reasoning astray. Um, it also involves pain in feeling anger, and it leads us to things that we think are going to be pleasant, like Achilles said, anger, pleasant as honey dripping from the comb. But when you see what your anger has done, we can see that same Achilles looking around and being like, oh, man, this isn't good. You know, think about the arguments that we have with people. Think about the... Um, 
think about all of the uh, mean things that we say or decisions that we make, those might not be that prudent. And, you know, in terms of justice, the point of justice is that we neither harm nor be harmed, that we follow laws and agreements. Does anger serve this social purpose? Sometimes Epicureans think it does. So if you're actually being harmed, then it makes sense to um, to retaliate in anger, to you know maybe push people away or criticize, and to be angry. That's what they later on Philodemus will call natural anger, and even the the wise person feels that. But it's because you're actually being harmed. A lot of people think they're being harmed when they're not being harmed, and then they do things, and an Epicurean could say, well, that's that's unjust, right? Um, the distinction between different kinds of desires. Some states of anger uh, would seem to involve neither natural nor necessary desires and arise from empty opinion. So examples of this, revenge fantasies. When you're thinking in your head, oh, I'm going to get that son of a bitch who crossed me, right? You know, and it could be trivial sort of things. Those are probably going to be empty or vain opinions that you've got rattling around in your head. And where did you get them from? Maybe your parents, your environment, the media. But the point isn't where you got them from. The point is that they're actually wrong and getting you in trouble. Um, demanding that other people agree with your perspective, which is also very common when you're angry. You know, you're expecting them to buy into, as we say, that we're expecting them to co-sign our nonsense. Again, from an Epicurean point of view, probably a bad idea. If you've got a whole bunch of wrongheaded, empty, vain opinions, and you've got desires for things that are neither natural nor necessary you're probably going to get angry a lot of the time because life is going to interfere with that. Other people are going to interfere with that, right? If you need everything to be just so, you're kind of setting yourself up for a life of aggravation. And, um, you know, there's a, a great observation in, in the Vatican sayings, poverty is great wealth if measured by the goals of nature, and wealth is abject poverty if not limited by the the goals of nature. So, you know, if social status or wealth or fame or stuff like that is what you're really aiming at, you're, you're not going to be able to satisfy yourself and you're going to get angry with other people or you're going to get angry with Facebook or YouTube or whatever, right? Uh, he's a, a couple other examples like this in the Vatican sayings. The stomach is not insatiable, as most people say. What's uh, in what's false is the opinion that the stomach needs unlimited filling, right? Or the esteem of others is outside our control. We must instead attend to healing ourselves. Or the ingratitude of the soul makes an animal greedy for endless variation in its way of life. These are all ways of talking about having wrong-headed ideas and um, getting ourselves all mixed up about this. So I'm, I'm actually going to pause for a second and take some of these uh, uh, questions from Virtual Natura. Many people throughout history have been angry at Epicurean people. Why do non-Epicureans get so angry at Epicureans? Do you imply that non-Epicureans are seeking some kind of vengeance against Epicureans because Epicureans are living a happier life? So that's wrong opinion right there. We don't know unless somebody actually shows themselves or says that they're angry at, at Epicureans, whether they are. Saying that people criticize doesn't mean that they're angry. You can criticize because you think somebody's got something wrong and you can criticize in a calm way. Cicero and Plutarch aren't angry at the Epicureans, neither is Lactantius. And so to assume that and project that on them, you got to ask yourself, where's that coming from? Right. So whenever you've got a, a, a canodoxia, a, yeah, canodoxia um, you want to back up and say, How, where did I get this idea from? And is it really in accordance with the facts? Um, all right. So let's jump to just a few things that I'll, I'll take on these other questions. So anger is very common, right? It, it, it can be part of our temperament. Um, it's often provoked by our environment or relationships. But the Epicurean is not going to like cultivate anger. It's not going to be something that they think is automatically a good thing. 
they're going to be suspicious. They're, you know, when they get angry, one of the things you could do is say, am I getting angry because I'm really being harmed here and I do need to like establish a boundary or set things right? Or do I have some wrong opinions about stuff going on? And if we think about the Epicurean garden, right, we do want to um, think about how people can be friendly with each other. How, how can households or families, um, the oikos in, in ancient Greek, how can that be um, minimizing the amount of, of wrong-headed anger or communities, larger communities that you might participate in, your workplace, uh, your political community, all of those are places where probably other people are going to get ticked off because they're not, you know, philosophically inclined. You don't have to get sucked into that. And as we said, co-sign their sort of nonsense, right? Um, Alligator says, I wonder what an Epicurean might say to those instances when somebody is angry for some reason when they grieve. Um, okay, so I, I don't think you need to be an Epicurean to note that there's a lot of people in our society and, and other societies who are not great at handling and living with negative emotions like grief, which is a kind of pain, right? And they're more comfortable with feeling anger instead. And this goes for not just grief, but fear or anxiety or shame or guilt, all of these negative emotions can easily be translated into anger, especially for men. Um, the more macho they are, the more insecure they are about their own masculinity. Um, anger is sometimes the only permissible, you know, socially permissible um, emotion to, to feel and to show to other people. But, you, you know, again, you want to ask yourself, where did I get that idea from? Is that an, a, a true idea? You know, let's measure this against things. And, you know, I, I always, so I've mentioned this before, uh, how liberating for me as a, um, not young man, but an adolescent who had lost his father uh, when my dad was only 36 and I was 11, reading the Odyssey in middle school, and I hadn't cried at my dad's funeral because I was told, you're the man of the house now. you got to be tough and all that sort of stuff. And reading the Odyssey and realizing that one of my, my great heroes, this super, super tough guy, Odysseus, could be weeping openly with all of his crewmates about their lost crewmates, that being a tough guy doesn't mean you can't cry. Um, how, how you know, and that you don't have to like go in a rage and, and try to kill people you can actually express that emotion. Um, now, going back to the grief thing, one other thing, sometimes you see people saying, how could you leave me? And they're angry at the dead. I mean, so I, I won't say you should just simply repress that emotion or ignore it or something like that. But again, does it make sense to actually be angry with the dead for leaving you? I mean, if you've got unfinished business, Maybe you're ticked off at them about that because they did you wrong, but that's a whole other ball game. That's being angry with them because you couldn't like vent your anger on them. Um, so yeah, um, virtual natura says, can anger be a positive and worthwhile emotion? Anger against a genuine injustice can be expressed in a calm and considered manner. Yeah, I mean, the Epicureans don't think that anger is always a bad thing. It depends on how it's, you know, what it's based on, whether it's based on there's an actual injury um, that you need to like fix or, or address, or whether it's based in empty, vain opinions that you have. Um, so yeah, just like the Aristotelians, just like the Platonists, um, anger can sometimes be what is called for. The problem is, is that most people wind up being wrong <laughs> when they decide that their anger is actually called for. And, and you don't necessarily have to express it in a calm and considered manner. There could be cases where you're actually being, you know, and people you care about is being attacked and you get angry and you, you retaliate, but you don't like go and kill everybody after that, or, you know, try to torture people or things like that. So yeah, the Epicureans think that anger can sometimes be the right thing. 
Um, I do want to point out in Cicero's On the Ends, um, when Torquatus is presenting the virtues as being a central part of Epicurean um, thought, which is, echoes the thought of Epicurus as we find it in Diogenes Laertes, he talks about wisdom or prudence and temperance, and that these um, help us distinguish and restrain unnecessary and unnatural desires. So they would have some role in dealing with anger. If you want to, from a classical Epicurean perspective, if you want to be able to, to manage your anger, you need to cultivate wisdom and you need to cultivate temperance. So he says, um, this is Torquatus, one who is perpetually swayed by conflicting and incompatible counsels and desires can know no peace or calm, and then they talk about mental diseases because um, they, they view these emotional disorders as being a sort of sickness. And so they talk about extravagant and imaginary desires. And among the examples that Torquatus discussed are the ill-tempered, the difficiles. And this goes back to like a you know, um, sort of common way of talking about Anger. Aristotle had talked about the chalapoi, which is, you know, the, it's like a cognate with, with difficiles in Latin, as people who get angry easily about trivial stuff, and they're just kind of a pain in the ass, you know? So, you know, what would be the remedy for that? Developing the virtues of prudence and temperance. The last thing I'll say about Epicurus, then maybe we'll do some more Q&A and then jump into Lucretius. Epicurus talks about our capacity for memory, and the Epicureans developed practices uh, involving this. So, you know, if we were practicing an Epicurean life, um, we could then remember how we handled situations, and we could, like, you know, go back over them, not in order to make ourselves feel crappy about it, because that's kind of pointless from an Epicurean point of view, but in order to develop more prudence, to make ourselves less prone to anger. And we can focus on remembering past pleasures, or we can focus on past pains. So holding grudges, for example, not a smart thing to do from an Epicurean perspective, because what are you doing if you hold a grudge? You're continually remembering this thing that this person did or said or failed to do or say, and you're getting yourself angry about it again in the present. That's almost the opposite of what you would want to do. But we see lots and lots of people in the present doing that. Here we go. Uh, uh, Hiram uh, says, Philodemus says that once the initial pang of indignation is endorsed as rational and natural anger, it can be productive if channeled into a course of action so we can live correctly and pleasantly. So there, there it is. We're going to talk about Philodemus in the uh, follow-up session that we'll have a couple months from now about Epicureans, because he's, he's got so much stuff to say that I wanted to put him off to the side, but it's good to bring him in. And, you know, he does have this idea of um, natural versus unnatural anger, which he tells us Epicurus himself had. Virtual natura, where does the rule of law fit into the appropriate expression of anger? Doesn't really. I mean, rule of law is a concept of we all are under the law and we all have to follow it. And that's sort of just a general legal principle. If you're saying, what do the laws themselves have to say about anger? Remember that for Epicurus, there is no absolute, you know, um, catalone justice. It's always within particular communities. But you can say that, you know, we restrict certain things. We, we say uh, you can't, you know, if you are really angry at somebody, that doesn't excuse you going up and punching the crap out of them, right? Um, so, you know, what what is that like in different societies? That changes over time. Um, we live in a time where I'd say there's less tolerance for expressions of anger than there used to be 100 years ago, at least for certain persons. But it's also very power-based, right? And we could say not just law, but we could talk about norms in society. Are women allowed to express anger as easily as men are? In many of our societies, still not the case. 
Um, Braden, Kim, why do Epicureans desire to spread their philosophy and views to other people since they created these ideas? I would assume it comes from some desire to share it, but where does that desire come from? I mean, this is a very simple answer that doesn't just have to do with Epicureans. If you think that you've got things right and you think that understanding the world rightly will make people feel less crappy in their lives and make you know less poor decisions, why the hell wouldn't you share it? You'd be kind of a jerk to hide you know, your proverbial candle under a bushel. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to like go out and tell everybody, oh, you must convert, become an Epicurean, or we will put you to the sword. The Epicureans aren't into that sort of thing, right? Um, but whether you're a Stoic, an Epicurean, an Aristotelian, pick whatever you want, if you think you actually have things correct, why the hell wouldn't you want the good for other people? You know, I mean, it's kind of painful to watch people messing up their lives, isn't it? So, yeah, there we go. Hiram says, uh, Epicurus closes his letter to Minosius saying, practice by yourself and with others of, of like mind. Very, very important point there. Epicureans seek to make other Epicurean friends. And uh, Hiram, if you want to put something in the chat, like a link to some of the places that, that people can go out there because there is a, a an Epicurean community. Um, I think that would be really awesome. Uh, alligator, if emotions help in moral development, would aiming to minimize disturbance overlook this potential for moral growth? Sorry if this is way off. Um, so disturbance, you know, would be... Uh, I think what you're thinking is trouble, uh, you know, ataraxia, trying not to be um, bothered by things. I mean, the sage gets angry in Epicureanism, but the sage doesn't get angry over trivial crap, right? The sage gets angry when in the course of this imperfect life that we live, people are injuring him or her or people that they care about or their community or something like that. And then they, you know, they do action that is stemming from that, but they don't like go overboard with revenge. Um, and, you know, even the Stoics think that emotions do help in moral development. There's the eupathi, right? The ones that you ought to be cultivating. So neither the Stoics nor the Epicureans are saying don't ever feel emotions, but you do want to, you do want to understand why you're feeling what you're feeling. And actually, I want to go to something else that, that Hiram brought up and we've talked about a little bit. Um, and I've, I've said this <clears throat> in, in a number of other places about other matters. Um, very often in ancient philosophy, things are presented to us as if we're supposed to be, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna figure all this stuff out, change our characters, you know, uh, develop good practical reasoning, like on our own. And, and there is a good point to that, right? What if we're thrown into a situation where we, we can't rely on anybody else, right? We don't know anybody else. But I think if you've got good friendships built up with people who can call you on your BS when you're engaging in it, you know, whether it's big stuff or little stuff, they can say, oh, man, you're screwing up. You, you need to look at things this way. I think that can be really, really helpful. And I think, you know, a lot of times we want to be able to go to people and say, am I on the right track here or am I totally off base? And I think this is really important with, with anger, but also with other negative emotions. You know, there are some things we should worry about. It's a pretty small amount. And then there's other things that we shouldn't. And asking somebody else, who's maybe a little bit further along or just another pair of eyes, a am I on the right track? That's something that I think communities of practice can provide us with. So, all right. Um, Braden says, logically, I would think sharing philosophies has some consequences, good and bad, going back to the ideas of natural and necessary. Since you can experience pain and anger when sharing your views, um, would Epicureans think it's not necessary or natural? I'm not sure what you, what the, yet, um, sharing your views. I mean, not all, not all of our desires. So the, the natural necessary matrix is about our desires and pleasures. 
Um, you can share your views without it necessarily being pleasant or painful. I mean, the Epicureans do share their views, right? They teach people in their, their garden. Epicurus writes the most out of any author in antiquity. So presumably it's, it's a, an enjoyable and worthwhile task for him. Um, but it, you know, the, the, is it based, here's the question you want to ask yourself with that. Is it based on empty opinion or not? Um, now Francis Wright, I don't know about Francis Wright. So that's not, that's not something that I'm going to comment on here. And I think that's probably a bit of a, um, what do you call it? Um, going, going into the weeds about this. So I don't know if Francis Wright was a good Epicurean or not. Um, Hiram maybe knows, but, but I don't. Let's talk about Lucretius. So what is Lucretius bringing to the table in On the Nature of the Universe? So a couple things. Um, you know, as uh, somebody who, who really pointed this out well is Albert Camus in um, The Rebel. He talks about Lucretius and Epicurus. And he says, you know, Lucretius, and I think he's right about this, casts Epicurus as a kind of savior figure, a sotor in in uh, uh, there's actually like depictions of Epicurus as, as a savior figure, not just as a founder of a philosophy, but as, you know, somebody who's imparting uh, wisdom to help us not be screwed up, right? To, to release human beings from having to live in fear, irrational fears about all sorts of stuff, um, God's anger, natural phenomena. He thinks that this is a really important thing. And so, um, you know, there's a, a, some interesting discussions there. One example, um, Lucretius thinks that these natural elements like fire and water and strife with each other, and every once in a while they overcome the world. And then he talks about this classical myth of Phaeton losing control of the chariot of the sun. Here's where the anger comes in. Struck down by Zeus in his anger. And Lucretius says, this is this is a story that we should reject. And he says, poor humanity to saddle the gods with such responsibilities and to throw in a vindictive temper. And Lucretius, like Epicurus, thinks that, you know, if you want to have any sort of connection with the gods other than just contemplating them, you can picture the quiet ones in their untroubled peace. Um, you know, if you if you do this, but you also think about them as tossed on turbulent waves of anger, you won't go to the temple with a quiet or tranquil heart. So, you know, the idea is get rid of these these crazy ideas about the gods getting angry. It's not going to help you. It's not factual. Um, it just makes you upset and maybe sets a bad example or makes you worried that they're going to smite you. So how does Lucretius um, look at anger? <clears throat> this happens a little bit later in book three, where he's setting out a physical theory. And this is probably, again, coming from Epicurus's On Nature. So he talks about these uh, elements, which, you know, makes sense. A lot of the ancient Greeks thought of things in terms of elements. And in this case, it's not, you know, earth, air, fire, water. It's actually fire or heat, okay, so that's similar, air, air, wind, which is cold, and then an unnamed element that is responsible for mind or consciousness. And all of these come together, and bodily things are made of these configurations. So when we get angry, there is a predominance of this heat element in what's going on, and it affects our minds and our bodies. And he, he says that some creatures have an excess of this heat or fire element in their composition. And so this causes them to have passionate hearts and angry dispositions. The paradigm case for this that he uses, lions. Now, he says something that's not factually correct, that they're so angry that they roar and burst their breasts as a result. But, you know, you ever seen a big cat angry? It's pretty damn scary, right? And there, by the way, there were still lions in Europe at that time. They're slowly being, you know, extinguished from the, the Middle East and the Mediterranean area so that you'd only find them uh, generally further south um, in, in other parts of the world. 
Um, so lions are kind of a good example, you know, in classical antiquity, we see others like, you know, bears, uh, wild boars, things, things along those lines, right? People can be like that too. Now, whereas animals tend to have, and this is a common idea in ancient times, animals tend to have kind of a fixed disposition. So lions are angry creatures. Deer are fearful creatures because they have too much of the wind in them. Um, cattle are kind of phlegmatic because they've got the air element predominating. We human beings are much more varied. So some people are more like lions. Some people are more like cattle. Some people are more like um, deer, depending on what sort of composition you have of this stuff in your body. Just like when we talked about with Plato, right? Some people are more thumotic, more inclined towards anger and the, the things that are connected with it. We human beings, though, we can change it. Now, you can't completely get rid of all, if you're an angry, irascible person, you can't get rid of it altogether. But you can reduce it, as he says, to very small, lingering traces, vestigii, little shadows that are left. And how do you do this? Through education, through training, through culture, and most importantly, through philosophy. And so, you know, studying Epicurean philosophy, according to Lucretius, would be a way to do this. Now, you know, maybe we've lost some of those resources. It would be really nice to have Ep uh, Epicurus's book on the passions <laughs> as a guidebook. Maybe we'll find it at Herculaneum. You know, there's, there's a possibility of that. So what does this mean? We have the possibility to change our nature to some degree. He also talks about social development, and he talks about, you know, human beings forming societies, and then eventually they're worn out by this constant violence within societies. And he talks about this distaste for a life of violence came naturally to a society where every individual was ready to gratify his anger by a harsher vengeance than is now tolerated by equitable laws. So having laws in place that say, if somebody crosses you, you can't do anything you like to them. You know, you can't have blood feuds going on for generation after generation. We have to work these, these sorts of things out. That's a sign of human progress, according to Lucretius. And Lucretius has like, you know, a whole account of this. And this is in uh, book five of the, the uh, on the nature of things. So we see that both in a societal way and for individuals or small groups, anger is something that has a natural basis. It's got a function, but it can be made worse or better through what we do with ourselves through culture. You know, if we're getting wrong messages from the culture, like, hey, man, if somebody crosses you, you better take revenge on them. And if we're watching like action films all the time, probably not a good influence, right? Um, if, we're, if we're also telling people, oh, you should never, ever, ever get angry. That's a bad thing. That's probably not a good idea either, right? So our culture, our education, our habituation, what we choose to do with ourselves, the relationships that we're in, all of those can help to make us less angry people and steer us towards having just rational, natural anger that's rooted in, in you know, a real reflection of how things are. So the Epicurean will get angry until we live in some sort of utopia, right? Um, but they're probably not going to get angry very much. And they're not going to want to seek out occasions to get angry. So they wouldn't be like rage posting, right? They're not going to be participating in online pylons on people or anything like that. Um, and, you know, maybe they would help to correct each other as well. So, all right, uh, virtual natura, could we change human nature to reduce anger by eliminating the male gender? I mean, no, because, I mean, it's it's ridiculous to think that uh, men and women don't get equally angry. Um, all you got to do is spend much time with them. And by the way, Plato noted that way back in the Republic, right? Uh, men and women can equally have thumos. 
Um, what makes people think that they don't? Wrong-headed ideas, again, canodoxia. Um, so no, that, that wouldn't help anything. There are so many different ways in which anger can be displayed. Uh, as a matter of fact, some ancient thinkers actually attributed anger more to women than to men, believe it or not. So that's a non-starter right there, even if it were physically possible. Any other questions, clarifications, comments? Um, we'll wrap up fairly soon. So I got to do some other things, but a lot of useful questions at this point. While people are writing them, I'll mention that next month we're going to look at Cicero and his references and discussions of anger. So we're talking about primarily Tusculan disputations, but also uh, on Duties Book One and a few other texts as well. And then we're going to veer off for a little while into Stoics. We're going to look at Seneca's whole book on anger. And then uh, the month after that, so um, March, that'd be May, we'll be looking at Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and their remarks about anger. And I haven't decided what we're going to do after that. We might come back to some more literary stuff or even look at some medical authors or come back to Philodemus. I'm holding out probably ridiculously, hope that we might get some, some new Philodemus stuff at least, you know, tantalizing hints of it coming out um, from the Herculaneum scrolls since they are making progress on that. Um, that would be very cool if that happens, but, you know, how much hope should we place in that? Maybe not not so much, uh, but that's what we have coming up. Uh, Amy says, this has been so interesting. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, we do this every month. Um, usually, we do this later in the month, but I had to move some other events around. My worlds of speculative fiction is usually on this second Saturday of the month. But since I have a special thing happening, the author of the, the two works, and this is a totally different series of uh, Bride of the Tornado and Dare to Know, James Kennedy from Chicago, will be joining us for the session. And he couldn't do it this weekend because he's got a special book release thing happening. But um, for Bride of the Tornado, but we'll be doing um, we'll be doing that later this month. Mark says if our friend is insulted and we feel that they should be justifiably angry and stand up for themselves, but they choose not to, should we be led by our anger on their behalf to stand up for them, or should we respect their choice and back down too? That's a good one. Um, that's one of those things where there isn't like a single hard and fast rule. I think right. Um, I, I suppose it would depend on, first of all, whether we think we can actually do something about it. So feasibility, you could say. And is our friend going to be pushed away by us acting on their behalf? Or are they, is there an expectation that we're going to act on their behalf? Those are some things that we would want to take into consideration. But I don't think that there is a single answer to that. Um, Andy says, if I remember correctly, Lucretius placed value on friendship and community as key components of a happy life. Wouldn't he say that anger undermines social harmony and the bonds between individuals, suggesting ang overcoming anger is not only beneficial for personal tranquility? Well, I mean, if you want to know what he suggests, read the book. <laughs> that's that's the, the, the simplest thing. Uh, he doesn't say that we must overcome anger in order to have social tranquility, and nor nor would he. I mean, Epicurus didn't say that, and Epicurus seemed to think that there's some cases where we we should get angry. So why would Lucretius say that? And if you think about it, people oftentimes need to have other people get angry with them and say, "Man, you're acting like an a hole. Uh, knock it off!" Right? In order to have that social harmony. It's a false harmony to never get angry at anybody, right? Even the Stoics who think that the emotion of anger isn't good will say sometimes you need to appear to be angry so that people who are doing the wrong thing can get the message that they better knock it off. So, you know, 
Um, in, in a great relationship, you probably don't need to get angry with each other, but you probably also need to get angry along the way with people. I mean, one of the best life lessons that I had as an angry young man was having somebody uh, who was angry with me and who was not willing to like talk with me as a result, say, act like an asshole, get treated like an asshole. I needed to hear that at that time. And that helped me straighten out. You know? So here is right. There's little possibility of moral development for ourselves and our friends if we banish natural anger. Yeah. I mean, from the Epicurean point of view and the Aristotelian and the Platonic, the Stoics would be the outliers in this respect. We need rightly directed anger in order to have good relations. There's, you know, you're not happy at the time that you're angry and it seems like things are disrupted, but what's the result? You know, um, think about how cats play with each other, right? Um, and cats, by the way, somebody says my cat never gets angry. Well, you got a weird cat then because most cats do get angry. And I just experienced it last weekend when I had to take uh, one of the cats and put him into a room that he didn't want to be in. And he escaped twice. And by the second, the, the second time I was bringing him in there, he was pretty pissed off at me. How do cats actually learn what's okay, what's not okay. They learn it as kittens by being aggressive with each other and then getting smacked down by the other cats. You know, the other cats hiss at them. The other cats, you know, knock them around. And then after a while, they're like, oh, I better not act like a, like a jerk anymore. I better not indulge my, my desires in the way that I, I want to. We human beings are a lot more like that. We're a predator creature, you know, naturally. We're not a herd prey creature like horses or cows or, I mean, goats are kind of like a little bit more like us. Um, some human beings are much more placid and that's nice, but a lot of us need to learn these lessons along the way. So, so this notion of natural anger, quite important uh, in this, and uh, there's a productive role for, for anger. The thing we have to watch is mistaking any feeling that we have where we think we're justified for actually being justified, thinking that we're actually injured when we're not injured and stuff like that. Elijah says, what resources may help anger over an unjustifiable history? Plato thinks anger would result from lack of virtue. That's false. But virtue cannot provide the desired justification increasing anger. Plato thinks that you need to be angry at some times. Um, and so do the Platonists. Thumos is an integral part of justice itself, right? So um, Plato doesn't, doesn't think that anger results automatically from lack of virtue. And I, I don't know what an unjustifiable history, like you mean like where there's bad blood between people? Um, I mean, what resources? The same resources as we find in everything else, um, sort of looking at philosophical practices and, you know, trying to get your mind right about these sorts of things. And, you know, the Epicureans, just like the Stoics, just like the Platonists, just like, you know, a lot of others, uh, they had a philosophy as a way of life where you, you engage in whether you want to call them spiritual exercises, like Pierre Addo calls it, or technologies of the self, like Foucault calls it, or just, you know, philosophical exercises or escasis, that's that's what you're doing. And it's an ongoing process. Some of that, I guess, would be cognitive, you know, figuring out is this history that we have really unjustifiable? Or if it is, do I have to get pissed off about it? You know, that, that could be part of it. Is it a productive response to be angry at things that happened in the past that I can't change now? That might be a way to, to look at it. So. All right, any other questions, comments, um, clarifications, issues? <sighs> Not seeing any at the time. Um, hear a lot of noise coming from next door. It sounds like they're having a little party. Uh, probably doing a little day drinking as well. Oh, Mark says, who's next on the menu? So Cicero, um, we're going to be looking at uh, Tusculan Disputations 3 and 4. Um, 
I mentioned uh, on the on the ends, we'll probably look at uh, um, some of the stuff in there, but mostly on duties book one. And then I also want to attend to some of the rhetorical dimensions. So he's <clears throat> he's got some rhetorical works like on the orator that would be relevant. Uh, alligator, is there an over-reliance on rational thought? I think humans are more irrational. I don't I have no idea what you're asking there. Is there an over-reliance on rational thought? Where? Among Epicureans? Um, no. Uh, no more than there is with any philosophy, if it's an actual successful philosophy. And the fact, I mean, you think that humans are more irrational. I guess you should ask yourself where you're getting that, you know, idea from that's so sweeping and why would why would that imply that we shouldn't be more rational you know there's a lot of assumptions i think rolled into there um but i you know it's hard to answer these very elliptical questions because they're a little bit too general ah here we go like my own anger is often impulsive so it's not human beings as such that you're worried about it's you that's a whole different question um, well, you can look at your anger, and there's all sorts of ways of doing this. Modern psychology has approaches, ancient philosophy has approaches, which are often copied from, you know, the, the modern psychologists, when they're successful, often copied ancient philosophy. Um, there's all sorts of ways of, of looking at that, and uh, you can figure out whether your own anger is too irrational and impulsive. Um, but thinking that humans per se are too irrational or that you shouldn't become more rational, that, that's not going to be helpful for you, I think. You want to focus in on, on what, where your own anger is coming from and whether you can fix it or not, right? All right. Well, we're getting close to the end of the time I've got allotted. Any other last questions, comments, issues, matters? Um, by the way, if you're interested in the previous um, nine sessions, there's a playlist that uh, you can easily just Google uh, Understanding Anger 2.0, and you should be able to find it. Um, and uh, I'm going to be creating uh, some, some places where people can find the resources, but I've got a lot of things on the plate right now. So, um, oh, th Hiram, thanks. Uh, very nice to get that feedback from you uh, because we, you know, got a genuine long practicing uh, uh, Epicurean in the room, group leader, uh, author. So that's, that's very nice. Mark says, what would be your Epicurean take on the intersection between pleasure and anger and heavy metal? Just passing thoughts. I mean, you know, it's interesting. So I'll go out on this one. There's, there's a, a perception. And I think it's a similar perception with um, with rap as well. Oh, heavy metal, so angry, so aggressive. It's bad for these people. You know, it like my mom used to say, oh, it's such angry music. I don't know how you can listen to that, you know. And they've done studies, social scientific studies, and they found that um, people who are heavy metal fans are very often not provoked to anger and ag aggressivity by listening to heavy metal, it often has a calming effect on them, not on everybody else. Right? So this is where we got to like be, you know, kind of like uh, prudent and qualify stuff. Um, you know, people take solace in, in music. People uh, use it to pump themselves up at the gym. People do all sorts of things with music. And it is pleasant to listen to music, right? The, the kind of music that you like. There's other kinds of music that you don't like. And you're like, I don't want to hear this crap, you know? And that varies significantly from people to, to people. So, all right, virtual nature. I'm trying to learn about the life of Francis, right? I would appreciate any of your thoughts if you have an opportunity to do research about her. That is not on my radar at all. I, I have so many different projects going on. The only way that I ever like veer from my already established plans is when somebody hires me to tutor them or produce videos about somebody else. Cause I, you know, my reading list is very, very packed. I have book reviews. I teach classes. Um, I, I, you know, it, the, the people that I'd really like to get to, you know, 
uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. I've been meaning to write stuff on her for a very long time. So I'm afraid that Francis Wright uh, is probably not going to be somebody who I do work on unless I wind up being commissioned about it. And then I put my other stuff on, on hold for the time being. All right, so I'm going to wrap up here. It's 1.30 in Milwaukee, whatever it happens to be. I know Mark is over in South Africa. Hiram's on the same time as me. Uh, whatever it is where you are, I hope you have a good rest of the day or night or morning or whatever it's going to be. And uh, I will see you next time. <laughs>